The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Education around diversity, equity, and inclusion, DE&I as it's sometimes called, is increasingly common in workplaces and schools. Is it meeting the challenge? Tonight, educator Shaquille Chowdhury on his book, Deep Diversity, and how such training has to take emotional intelligence seriously if it's to tackle systemic racism. Then we'll widen the conversation and ask, why are we still struggling to move the needle and could new approaches to training be part of the solution? It's Tuesday, April 26th, and that's next on The Agenda. After the events of the past year or two, the Black Lives Matter movement, a pandemic-era rise in hate crimes towards Asian Canadians, the Islamophobia that we saw last year in London, Ontario, the conversation around racism has changed. And people who want to make a difference are looking for answers. Educator Shaquille Chowdhury has spent the past 20 years working on just that. And his new book offers lessons for us all. It's called Deep Diversity, a compassionate scientific approach to achieving racial justice. And it brings Shaquille Chowdhury back to our airwaves tonight from Ontario's capital city. Shaquille, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks, Steve. A pleasure to be back here. Excellent to have you. Well, occasionally we get nostalgic on this program, and it occurred to us that you haven't been... Um, you, you, you talked to my co-host, Nam Kiwanuka, a couple of years ago, but you and I have not sat down for a chat in seven years. So why don't we start with a clip from that last interview that we did back in 2015. Sheldon, if you would. What's really important to recognize is that our implicit bias, if we are not able to detect it, if we're not able to catch it early when the costs are low, in this case, the cost was personal embarrassment and the fact that I'm sharing it with you, uh, then under stress and time pressures, the consequences may be greater. So for example, I'm a doctor and and uh, I don't know that my biases are at play at this unconscious level, then I may undertreat patients, which is what a lot of the research shows. If I'm a police officer and I haven't um, recognized that I've got biases uh, towards certain groups of people, I may use excessive force and then tragedies as we're seeing south of the border because police officers are seeing, because they're stereotypes, threat and danger where there isn't any. So that was us talking unconscious bias back in 2015 after your first book came out, Deep Diversity, Overcoming Us Versus Them. You have apparently decided there is more to say on this. How come? Well, for a number of reasons. One is that in when my book came out in 2015, um, Donald Trump hadn't showed up on the scene. And Donald Trump has changed the conversation about what's happening and the level of polarization. That was one of the factors. The other factor is that I think it took me about six years to grow into my book, meaning what I wrote down, I then took to the US and across Canada and I got both accolades and challenges on it and I felt like that was important to update. And also the last thing is that Society is finally ready to have a conversation about the most important part of the book and of all the work that I and others do around issues of racial justice and equity, which is to have a conversation about racism in its systemic forms. That suggests that you think we have made some progress on the issues of unconscious bias and systemic racism today versus seven years ago. You think that's true? I think to some degree, I think that there's more awareness, for example, around issues of unconscious bias. However, overall, there's more openness to understanding systemic, and I think that part's really important. I'm seeing more organizational leaders showing up saying, we don't know what's going on, we really need some help. And these are leaders at the highest levels. Now, that wasn't quite the case half a dozen years ago. So I'd say we've made some progress. However, I think we are still stuck at this really important and difficult place about separating overt forms of racism from systemic forms. And overt forms are awful, but easier to identify. We know who we have to challenge with overt racism. It's the racists. But with systemic forms of discrimination, we 
have to confront ourselves because all of us can recreate and reinforce a system in which uh, people of color, indigenous peoples, black people uh, are systematically undertreated by our words, our actions, and our outcomes. And so I would say that that's, that's the work that I've been trying to do for 25 years and that my peers and the justice frame have been trying to do. And that is the toughest thing because it's very emotional. And I think that we really have to start working and dealing with the emotions underneath, which is part of why I really am encouraging us to develop emotional literacy in this work because all of this work around bias is emotional. Well, you wrote about some of these issues in a column in the Globe and Mail not too long ago, and uh, I want to read an excerpt from that. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up. Systemic discrimination isn't intuitive unless you experience it directly and only becomes widely visible through data analysis. Various studies show that resumes submitted with white-sounding names such as John or Jessica can have a higher chance of a callback for interviews than those with names like Jamal or Jugdeep. We may not even be aware we are acting with this bias, something any of us can be implicated in regardless of skin color or identity. To address such racist patterns, we have to confront ourselves. This is tricky because self-interrogation makes many of us feel defensive, angry, or ashamed. My experience and research demonstrates that emotions are critical to facing the racial equity puzzle. Yet as a society, we don't do emotions well, nor do academics, the de facto leaders of social justice work. So much to pick apart there, Shaquille. So let's start here. What do you mean as a society we don't do emotions well? Well, we are here in Canada and the U.S. Uh, we follow the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant norms. And white Anglo-Saxon Protestant norms, there's nothing wrong with them, except when they become the dominant norm that everyone has to function by. And within the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, frame, we have a very narrow band of emotions. And so as a result, we don't really pay attention that much to emotions. And we tend to prioritize thinking over feeling. And all the research, in fact, shows the opposite, that we are not rational creatures. We like to believe we are, but we are, in fact, emotional creatures. And us starting with that as, 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 as um, the beginning is actually really the help, is really most helpful. So, so emotions are the driver. In fact, neuroscientists would say that our, our um, next thought is based uh, on our last feeling, whether we're aware of that feeling or not. And feelings are at that emotional level. And so we have to bring emotions into the room because they're already in the room. So what we need to do is learn how to dance with them, our own emotions and the emotions of other people, because they're having the greatest amount of impact. Whether we like to pretend that emotions aren't in the room, whether we, we'd like to keep them out of the room, it is, they're, they're profound. And people are feeling big things, especially when we're talking about issues of race, gender, and identity, because it touches us at this core level of survival whether we're aware of that or not. And so the emotions get really big. So what we've got to be able to do is become more emotionally intelligent and develop more emotional literacy while we're developing uh, um, the political literacy to help us understand issues such as systemic racism. Well, I wonder if you'd make that case because um, EQ is not something every, every person has. Uh, obviously, some people have a lot more of it than other people do. And obviously as well, a lot of people have done very well, thank you very much, in society, be it in the corporate world, in the uh, yeah. public world, um, and, and they don't have particularly good EQs. So how, how would you make the case to them that they need to up their EQ even if they have been, quote unquote, a success in their world? Well, emotions are invisible and controlling according to the research. So for example, uh, one of the classic experiments is three strangers sitting in a room facing each other and not saying anything. And within a very short period of time, in some cases minutes, all three people share the same mood. And the mood is transmitted by the person who's the most emotion emotionally dominant, the most emotionally expressive. And this happens without talking and without any prior history. So that is a function of... Uh, 
how uh, we are wired. We are mammals and our nervous systems are wired to co-regulate, which is why um, you can be, work teams can be in a, in, in, a, in a time period and someone in a meeting can have really negative energy and drop the whole team down or have really positive energy and keep them up. So emotions matter and especially matters for leaders. So what uh, we can try to ignore them, but emotions, emotions are in the room and they drive our behavior. So ultimately, if we're not aware of them, it makes us reactive. When we become aware of them, it makes us responsive. And the more that in my work and research that when we're dealing with issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, or racial justice, that when we give more space for emotions to be present in a way that is regulated in a room where people are given permission to be okay and even touch their name, their emotions, we're just more successful. People are much more willing to talk about the difficult concepts in a way that's compassionate and thoughtful as opposed to reactive or shut down. Okay, let me ask you about power dynamics. And to that end, I want to ask you about an expression that we hear all the time these days, and that is white privilege. And I want to give you a scenario here, and I want you to help us understand, well, just to get inside it and help us understand it better. Sure. I suspect a 58-year-old West Virginian former coal miner uh, who's just lost his job, who's mm -hmm. white, is going mm -hmm. to have a hard time understanding that he enjoys white privilege, That's right. while a 25-year-old, and again, I'm plucking this uh, example out of nowhere, but a 25-year-old South Asian mm -hmm. software engineer who lives in San Francisco and makes six figures a year is somehow uh, hard done by. Explain. Right. Well, you've got two things happening there. One is that we've got to understand privilege more broadly. And understanding it broadly means recognizing that there are many identities that we possess. In the coal miner example, you're talking about someone who is working class. And we know that, that there is class privilege that they do not benefit from. And in the context of the software engineer, uh, that may be brown and earning more money, that uh, they struggle with um, being uh, with um, being marginalized because of their race. So there's racial privilege or racial marginalization that's happening there. Now these two things don't have to compete. What we have to be able to do is look at the realities of both of these things. And um, I think that the mistake would be to dismiss the white coal miner. The reality is is that um, class is a big deal. And we should talk about class privilege and how they don't benefit from that. And also within that context, also make it more complicated because as much as there are white coal miners, what about the coal miners of color? And how are they doing in that context? Let's have a conversation about there and see how race and class come together. And then when we're talking about the software engineer, well, the reality is, is that we know that Silicon Valley is still predominantly white. So as much as we might think that East Asian or South Asian um, uh, tech folks should be doing really well there, they're not. So let's have a conversation about what's happening there too. So I don't think we have to pit these against each other. I think what we have to do is recognize that, that we benefit from different parts of privilege. So for example, for myself, yes, I've experienced internalized racism. And yes, um, race can play out in subtle ways from uh, stores and you know cottage rentals to to neighborhoods that these things play out in very subtle ways. But I'm also real. I also have a lot of class privilege. I'm here talking to you because I wrote a book. That means that I'm at a particular class of um, middle upper middle class. So so to believe that the only thing that's functioning for me as a race would just be a huge problem. The idea is what are the different identities we possess. And, um, and understanding them and being thoughtful about them, not just holding on to one or the other, but becoming more fluid. And again, the ability to become fluid is emotional. And to be able to see the patterns is also part of that. All right, let me follow up with this. In the areas of unconscious bias that we talked about earlier and the excerpt mm -hmm. I read from your Globe and Mail piece, if, if an employer or if a landlord is a person of color, do they experience or can they experience the same 
discriminatory unconscious bias against, and let me use the names you used, against a potential employee or tenant named Jamal or Jagdeep than they would against somebody named John or Jessica? Uh, do you mean can they be on the on the giving end of of um, of racist behavior? Yeah, can they, can they be just as racist in their in their presumptions about Jamal and Jagdeep versus John or Jessica as say a fifty five year old white male employer or landlord? Everyone can reinforce racism. Hmm. So what I would say is that um, I, as a person of color because of decisions that I make can reinforce racism. My words can reinforce racism. My actions can reinforce racism. So uh, so no one's clear of that because we're talking about systems. Uh, at the same time, if I'm a landlord or I'm a boss, I can also experience um, racism coming to me from employees as well because there are just ways that there may be, um, I may be taken more for granted. Uh, I people may feel like they can challenge me more than they can a white boss. So I want to say that our, all of our actions and words, regardless of our identity, can reinforce racism and sexism. I tend to stay away from words like you're a racist uh, or you're a homophobe um, because that becomes an identity and it feels like identities can't change. But when we talk about our words being racist, our, our actions being racist, well, we can change our words and actions to be more inclusive and more thoughtful. Understood. I just wanna make that a... Gotcha. Okay, let me follow up with this. Um, if there's one thing a white person does not wanna be told, whether it's that 58-year-old unemployed coal miner I just referred to, or for yeah. that matter, a corporate executive, the one thing that white person doesn't wanna to be told is that they enjoy white privilege. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder, if we look at the other side of the coin now, why do you think it's so difficult for people to identify their own privilege in our society? Fundamentally, because we haven't been taught about it, one. So that's that's a big part of the problem. The second thing is that it's really emotional. Because as soon as we talk about privilege, it feels like what we're saying is that people didn't work hard. And that's the problem, is that we equate somehow working hard with privilege. And what I want to say really clearly is that everybody has to work hard. If our kids want to graduate from school, it's A to B, it's uphill. Uh, if they want to get a job, it's A to B, it's uphill. If they want to um, uh, get promoted at, at work, it's A to B, it's uphill. So everyone works hard. What the competition about privilege says is that when we know something like white sounding names have a higher, perchance, uh, higher chance of callback for interviews, we're just saying that a lot of white people don't know that. And that's invisible privilege. It's like a wind at their back that's kind of helping with, with the uphill journey. And what we want to be able to do is recognize that everyone, we sort of assume in society incorrectly that everyone who got to be were the ones that worked the hardest. But the problem is, is that some people had to work two, three, four times as hard to get to be. And yet that's not acknowledged. And some people uh, might have worked 10 times as hard as everyone else, but didn't get to be because there was so much headwind. They had so much resistance because of their identities and their background, there's mental health issues, there's a single parent, there is multiple jobs that are going on, that, um, that the wind kind of broke their sails and that there's a way in which uh, they didn't get there. So hard work gets to be tricky. And on one level, we intuitively know that. On another level, we have to learn that our identities benefit us. Uh, I know my identity as a man, for example, benefits me to be able to talk about leadership things. I get questioned less than, say, a female uh, counterpart does. Just because I was born into a male body means that there's a certain kind of privilege I have to do nothing for. It makes certain things easier. And so whether it's race or gender or sexual orientation or disability, us becoming aware of our identities um, can actually support us fundamentally in learning to hold our identities lightly and not be so attached to them. But often people get really attached to their identities because there isn't space given. And, uh, and so what we need to be able to do is just recognize that and step in that paradox of becoming fluid around being able to talk about race and gender and sexual orientation. And in doing so, it can allow us then to not have to hold on to those identities so, light, uh, so tightly, which I think often happens.
I guess fundamentally it's an understanding that we're not all born at the same starting line. Some people are actually right. born at second base or third base. That's right. And they've That's got right. advantages. Okay. You know, um, you work in this field of diversity and inclusion training. You've been doing it for many, many years. This is, if I may say, it seems to be a booming industry. There are many corporate uh, HR departments that um, make diversity training. Um, you know, some of it's voluntary, but a lot of it's mandatory as well. And I wonder whether you see this as progress that, no pun intended, this is getting on our province's agenda, and therefore we're making strides. What do you think? In some ways, that's true. The only thing is, is that, I mean, I'm glad for the conversations to happen, but we then have to look at what's the quality of what we're doing and how effective is it? And are we measuring to see if these things make a difference or are we just like emotionally making ourselves feel better by doing this? Some organizations just do that. They generally are just like, we need to have a diversity training and they invite people in and, and, uh, and it's not effective because it's a one-off. But training, if it's one part of a, of many of a multi-pronged strategy that includes senior leadership, uh, strategic planning, um, measurement and data, uh, bias filters through all their HR systems, then then it can make a make a difference. And however, right now, whether it's diversity training or anti-racism training, I feel like we're really struggling because they're not all effective, and. They can't be effective unless they're part of a multi-pronged process. But even as trainings themselves, you know, for example, if, if you're mandating training, frequently mandated trainings backfire. People show up with their backs, uh, their shoulders kind of hunched, ready to be scolded. And if that's the way that they leave, you might not have done um, a better job. And so I think that one of the things that's really needed is, is again, bringing, creating a kind of psychological safety for people to learn. And that's where bringing the emotional awareness is important and also not just focusing on the historical and the political. And that tends to be how justice work tends to be shared is it's, it's historical and political. And that's part of the problem because that's linear. And some of the ways that we teach um, racial justice work inside organizations or outside organizations tends to be very pedantic and kind of authoritarian in its orientation. Whereas we need way more strategies that engage adults um, using a, a proven adult-based methodology, but also show up with compassion and the ability to make mistakes. And, and what we found is that when people do that, people can actually then actually have the conversation uh, that needs to happen because we can't confront a problem as complex as systemic racism without having an honest conversation about it. And right now, we're not having a lot of honest conversations. People are having very performative conversations or doing things because they have to do them, not necessarily because they understand them or believe them. And that fundamentally can just create the conditions for backlash. And, and I think part of, the, part of the work that we do is really centering emotions because emotions aren't an impediment to the work around justice. It is the work. And so I think that we've got to work at that level. That is a great place to leave this off. Uh, Shaquille Chaudhry, author, Deep Diversity, A Compassionate Scientific Approach to Achieving Racial Justice. Uh, it's so good to have you back on our airwaves here at TVO. And uh, thanks for this conversation, uh, which we hope is a bit of a down payment on the work that needs doing going forward. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Ontario has one of the most diverse populations in the world, but not everyone is currently getting the fair shake they might, even when emphasis is placed on eliminating bias and moving towards greater fairness and inclusion. Where does that leave the kind of workplace training on offer today, and how can it help get results? Let's ask, in Waterloo, Ontario, Kathy Hogarth, professor and dean of the Faculty of Social Work at Wilfrid Laurier University. And our next three guests, all in the provincial capital, starting with Joshua Harold, professor in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Innovative Learning at Humber College and at the University of Guelph Humber. Indigenous Human Resources Consultant Crystal Abitasaway, President of IPAC, the Indigenous Professional Association of Canada. She's a senior manager at TD Bank. And we welcome back Shaquille Chowdhury, 
author of Deep Diversity, a compassionate scientific approach to achieving racial justice and co-founder of Anima Leadership. And it's great to have you all on our program tonight. Shaquille, let's just sort of uh, do a quick recap here. In the interview that just aired, you said that a lot of the diversity and inclusion training that's being mandated by employers is not particularly effective and not particularly good. How come? Well, I'd start like this by saying, uh, I'd back up a little bit and say that most people will say things like diversity training doesn't work. And I want to start by saying that uh, to say diversity training, equity and racial justice training doesn't work is like saying learning to read and write doesn't work. Learning to read and write has been embraced in society as a literacy project with an estimation of 360 hours to become uh, for an adult to become literate in English, for example. Now, equally, racial justice and equity needs to be embraced as a literacy project with a similar benchmark of 360 hours of learning to develop any kind of fluidity. See, initially, letters are just squiggly lines. They don't mean anything, but over time, as we learn to read and write, letters, words, sentences all gather and, and they create meaning. And pattern recognition, once you decode the pattern, reading and writing is, is much more simple. Equally, Racial justice and equity needs to be reframed as a literacy project because there are predictable patterns. And the problem is we haven't been taught about these patterns. And so as a result, we don't recognize them. So uh, if a manager doesn't recognize, for example, the long established pattern that women are more likely to be interrupted at meetings than their male counterparts, then they don't see the pattern, they don't interrupt it, and they don't link it to sexism. And as a result, women are demoralized under their watch. And so what I would say is that Racism and sexism, for example, are system problems, and we've got to help leaders become system thinkers. And that's developing pattern recognition skills, and I would suggest that 360 hours is a good benchmark to start with. All right, let's survey your colleagues here on the program tonight and see what they think about work workplace-mandated diversity and inclusion training. Kathy, you want to start us off? What's your view on it? You know, I think I'm going to use the analogy Shaquille just used. I, I think it is not the problem of literacy, EDI literacy. I really think it is literacy and that workplace training is not the outcome. There must be more. Why folks would say it's not working is simply that we do training and then what? So there are a lot of folks who know how to write well. And then what? What do you do with writing well? So we must be doing more than merely workplace training. We've trained people to be great racists. We've given them great language for racism to use it as tools in their racist um, in continuing racism. And so I think it is literacy and then. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Crystal, would you follow up? Workplace mandated training. What's your view? Yeah, I would say that if we are training once a year, of course, that's not going to be effective. Diversity inclusion is a lifelong journey. It's a process. And being one of the most diverse countries, cities, you know, it's, you can't travel to every country in one year. It's ongoing. And so to be effective, we need to do as much storytelling that always on approach that my colleague just mentioned, of course, needs to take place. It's, it's when we have strong understanding of one another and take that time to really learn. Uh, that's when we'll see true success. Joshua, your view. I think the mandated training provides a good starting point for conversation and discussion, but it needs to foreshadow some bigger changes to follow. And so to the and then question, we need to think about how uh, diversity and inclusion training is uh, reflective of broader organizational cultural shifts that are to follow. So employees, workers know uh, how they can use the language, how they can use the concepts that they're, they're learning about in the session 
in a meaningful way, something that translates into their daily practice, their daily routines, their, their daily tasks, rather than a kind of segmented one hour or over the lunch hour uh, um, session, and then what happens. So the what happens after needs to be experiential. It needs to be a part of those daily organizational tasks and is sort of infused into the broader organizational culture. Crystal, let's do a little first-person examination of your situation. Your work in human resources, uh, a lot of conversation in the workplace, obviously, these days. To the extent when people come into the workplace, it happens. I know a lot of us are online right now. But diversity, diversity inclusion, HR departments are all over this, all over the place. What's it been like for you working in HR these last few years? We definitely saw a shift two years ago with George Floyd, and now diversity inclusion has become the buzzword. My worry is that we lose momentum. And, you know, I think I was doing diversity and inclusion, you know, 10 years ago, uh, maybe when it wasn't so popular. And what I can tell you is that we're seeing a shift, not just with shareholders, but stakeholders who want more transparency. They, they ask, they're asking the right questions around who's in the boardrooms, uh, and if not the right people that represent communities, you know, what are they doing about it? And so I think that's my hope is that, and also I'm seeing a lot of positive momentum and impact taking place is that organizations need to have, and not just the, the brand, but also the executives, the leaders. And so with that, that positive change, I think we'll, we'll, we're seeing more of it and we'll continue to see more of it, which again is makes me very hopeful for the future. Let me do one quick follow-up with you, Crystal, and that is, do you think HR departments in companies across the province are capable of doing the kind of diversity training that you would like to see? It really can't just fall on human resources. It has to be in the ethos of the organization. Diversity and inclusion has to be in, in the employee value proposition, in the mission, in the values. Uh, we need to hear it at the top of the house with our senior executive teams, and we also need to see it um, you know, embedded in everything that we do. So again, if it if it's just the responsibility of HR, you know, I think we're not gonna see the results that we want to. It won't be an inclusive culture. However, if it's in the ethos and the DNA of the organization, those are the organizations that are gonna win in the space of talent. Those are the organizations I think that will truly thrive uh, with all communities there and, and represented. Kathy, let me get you on that. Do you think HR departments are capable of doing what needs doing? No. I, I, I'm with Crystal on this in terms of it is not the role solely of an HR department. Changing the discriminatory racist landscape of our society is all our jobs. It is the manager's job. It's the, the boardroom. It's the, the students. In my field of work, it is all our work we must come to a place of society where we recognize that changing the social landscape for folk, changing racism in our, in our country, in our society, is my job as an individual. It's your job. It's all our jobs. And we can't relegate it to one group of folk, one unit in an organization. It must be seen as all our work. All right, I take your point. Uh, Shaquille, maybe you could follow up in this regard. You know that there are companies which have employees who either virtually or in person are going to be treating this exercise as a kind of a, well, you know, we got to do this, so let's just sit through it. We'll check the box off that we've got it done and we can move on with our lives. What would you say to those people? Well, it's not to those people. It's actually to their leaders. I think uh, two big areas. There's there's macro reasons why why diversity training, racial justice and equity trainings can succeed or fail. Their success, first of all, is premised on on training, as as the other guests have pointed out, not being the only thing. It often fails because training is seen as a replacement for culture change, as though training was going to create the culture change, whereas. A culture change strategy that has training as a support underneath it is much more likely to, to, to succeed. Secondly, executive leaders are the linchpin here. And executive leaders most often don't see themselves 
they just think HR or someone else is going to fix the problem. And that is the problem. They don't realize that their strengths and weaknesses, their awareness, their, their sexism and their bias is actually playing out throughout the system. And so executive leaders, when they come to us, they say things like, just tell us what to do. And this isn't a what to do problem. This is a how to be problem. And that's where you get the difference between reactive and responsive. And one organization that I was working with um, you know, has been on this journey with, uh, for since 2016 with us. And their litmus test came at the George Floyd moment. They went from b- not knowing a lot to developing the 360 hours of literacy, what I, I would say, moving in that direction so that when George Floyd happened, they were the, one of the only organizations I know that already moved towards trauma supports for their uh, black identified employees. They're uh, also an organization in which, in which, uh, when in the and this is in the U.S. Uh, in the Midwest, that one of their billboards uh, got vandalized by uh, by outrage around the um, George Floyd killing and was really focusing on Black Lives Matter. Many organizations would just take that billboard down. Instead, the leaders had learned enough that they were like, "This is the right message." We need to amplify this. So instead of removing the billboard, they put the billboard in the busiest intersection of the city because they thought that was the right message to get across. So so when it's done, when training is done in a context of broader organizational change, which is looking at feedback and audits and actual DEI strategies with teeth and accountability structures, you're much more likely to get success in the training. And then you're less likely to have people saying, this is a checkbox because What matters to my boss matters to me. And that is a really big role modeling piece that is most often forgotten about and least developed and as a result creates the biggest problems. All right, having said that, Joshua, and just out of curiosity here, obviously every company wants to have good, plugged in, strong leadership from the top setting an example. We've talked about this already here tonight, the importance of that in a workplace culture. But why couldn't this happen from the bottom up? What's to say employees couldn't lead the charge and try to convince management of the uh, error of their ways and bring them around? Well, I think it's a lot to ask of employees who are already doing their work to take on this uh, um, you know, role or this responsibility. But what I do think makes sense in these situations are to adopt um, a type of paradigm shift that the other panelists have described where you have an employees as partners kind of approach. So rather than a top-down heavy approach where, uh, you know, managers or middle managers and employees are uh, checking the box off to, you know, confirm that they did the training or doing an asynchronous online module about uh, diversity and inclusion, we need to see employees, uh, uh, you know, everyone from all sectors of an organization, from a business, you know, from my perspective in the post-secondary sector on board and working cooperatively, cooperatively and collaboratively, right, to build and rebuild those structures that ensure an inclusive workplace environment. If you leave it just to the employees um, without the the support and the resources to build viable, long-lasting, equitable structures, I don't think it will last. All right, Crystal, let me try this. We all know it's difficult at the best of times to have serious, respectful, meaningful conversations about Uh, racism and race, period, anywhere. Is the workplace the right place to be having these kinds of conversations and expecting progress to be made in those circumstances? I think yes. And, you know, what you can see organizations do is, you know, what's the right conversations to be having. And so, you know, sometimes we'll see organizations completely take DNI out of out of it for for the sake of risk of what could go wrong in a conversation. And I think the alternative is that we get to a place where we're comfortable saying, I'm wrong, I made a mistake. Um, you know, that was not my intention. Because that's the only way we move forward. The more uncomfortable we are, our leaders, our people to say, I thought this way, but now having this conversation, I know more and I want to move forward and I, you know, I want to look at my biases, look at maybe the unconscious, um, 
you know, way of, of how I've thought about something. And so I think if we become more comfortable with being uncomfortable, that's where we'll really see success and we'll have meaningful conversations with uh, organizations and the people within them. Kathy, I'm going to follow up with you on that because I know nowadays mm. the expression safe spaces is used quite frequently. The idea being we've got to create safe spaces in which people can have these kinds of important and meaningful conversations. But if you've got your senior manager on, you know, on the line or in the meeting where you're having these conversations, or if the CEO of your company is involved in that, how safe a space is that for you to really dig deep and, and explore all of the potential meanings of what we're talking about here? Yeah, safety have, have different meanings for us based on a particular position at a, any given time. So if I'm in a precarious position in my institution and in my organization and my CEO is there, I may not feel safe and that may be a real risk. But I want to move us beyond a safe space to talk about brave spaces. You asked the question earlier about, is the workplace a good place to have these discussions? I say every space is a good space to have these discussions because racism is a relational reality. Racism exists in relationships. So anywhere we have relationships, the church is a good place to have it, to have these discussions. The dinner table is a good place to have these discussions. The workplace, definitely, these are the places where we have relationships. Safe spaces, we can often hide behind safe spaces. Well, I don't feel safe. And sometimes we also need to push ourselves to move out of what is safety and let's understand what safety is. Oftentimes when we talk about safe spaces, we are talking about comfortable spaces. And it's not necessarily racism. Talking of having these discussions isn't comfortable. It's not comfortable for anyone. And so it's not necessarily, let's, let's talk about what safe spaces really mean. It's not the same as comfortable spaces. So I like to push us to brave spaces and having these difficult conversations in brave spaces. Okay, from safe spaces to brave spaces, but Shaquille, I saw you nodding your head while Kathy was giving that answer. But having said that, how much bravery do you think it's reasonable to expect from employees to basically, you know, open up their hearts, open up their, put, put themselves out there, splayed on a table in front of all of their colleagues and maybe senior managers in a workplace to have this discussion? So the way you've described it to me speaks of one of the big problems in terms of how we approach this work is that we just think we should be able to have these conversations. There's no baby steps put in place to help people. Uh, it's pretty tough to have a brave conversation in an environment where people aren't even allowed to, to um, share how they're feeling. So in our work, what we do is we help managers through year-long programs in which they're given tools and practices first to become vulnerable themselves. Their own vulnerability is really important, but also to create the right permissions because psychological safety is critical. Psychological is critical for high performing teams because it's the teams that make the most mistakes and are able to innovate that are high performing. They, they speak back to each other, they speak back to managers in a context in which uh, that's the same thing with diversity, equity, inclusion. Psychological safety is critical. That's the overlap between high performance and, and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, um, what, what, what people need to be able to do is recognize there's gotta be choice in the process. And if you don't understand the patterns of why vulnerability might be hard and why it might be hard for indigenous folks or for folks who identify as uh, LGBTQ2S plus uh, or black folks in a context that's predominantly white and straight, then you, you are going to create an environment where it's not tactful, it's not thoughtful, but we can create strategies where people are able to take the baby steps. The first step is we invite people to do what we call team pulses. How are you doing on a scale of one to 10? And, and even that is something that requires habit building processes to get people comfortable. So, and then helping them about being able to talk about bias and what bias then means in organizations broadly and then in our organization. So you've got to graduate people into the process where they can 
build safety through both taking risk and exercising boundaries. Otherwise, you can make it unsafe because you've just like said, hey, I've just learned this new thing and I'm just gonna start inviting people to share their stories. Well, that might not work because you haven't created a strong enough container, but we teach managers how to do that. We can teach anybody to do that. It requires listening skills, pattern recognition skills, and um, speaking from the heart and being vulnerable. Those are all things that it is possible to do. Otherwise, it can be kind of reckless and it can actually uh, backfire as opposed to create more uh, create more trust and safety. So there's methodology that's needed here. There's process that's needed here. Otherwise, it can go south. But we've seen lots of successes in which it goes really well and managers are having conversations with their teams that they've never had before that have supported the team in moving forward. And so there's lots of ways to do it, but you've got to do it thoughtfully. You can't just do it randomly. No, I take your point, but I want to get onto even trickier ground with this next uh, round of questions if I can. And Josh, I'll start this with you. Uh, I have seen this happen. I have seen it happen whereby there is diversity training taking place and uh, a Jewish employee will say, you know what, I have the feeling that I am being targeted in this conversation because people of color see me as part of the white power structure, whereas the Jewish employee may see him or herself as part of one of the most discriminated against ethnic ethnicities in human history. And there's just a very different view of of what that all entails. How do you negotiate your way around all of that? Well, it's a tricky question, but I think in, you know, around questions of whiteness and Jewishness, we need to consider that Jewish belonging and otherness needs to be understood as a kind of historical, social, and political process. And so whiteness is often, but not always privileging. And to your example, where Jewish uh, colleagues may feel they're being left out or even targeted. I think, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, anti-Semitism today is not the structural problem that it was at the turn of the 20th century in Canada and in the decades, you know, leading up to the Second World War. But at the same time, um, we know from police reported data, uh, recent reports that have come out about uh, anti-Semitism and, and uh, uh, violent incidents and so forth that we've seen shootings in synagogues over the last several years, that Jews continue to be um, targeted and sort of cast as outsiders. And so while whiteness is privileging for white Jews in Canada, there are limits to that whiteness. And so rather than asking if Jews are white, Part of the way the conversation can be framed is around proximity to whiteness. And this is something that is relevant not just for white Jews, uh, but also for other groups as well. There's research on white Muslim converts, for example, or Iranian Americans and the limits of whiteness. And the sort of tension that's negotiated between legal categories where white Jews are recognized as white, but that differs from their lived experiences and experiences with anti-Semitism. And in some of my research, I look at how memories of the Holocaust, for example, how experiences, contemporary experiences with anti-Semitism kind of temper uh, uh, belonging and, and limit whiteness, or at least give white Jews a sense of distance from whiteness and those power structures. So it's a tricky space to be navigated. And to the points that were made before about every space being, uh, you know, a, a, an opportunity to have these conversations and why training may not necessarily work is because these complex n negotiations that so many people, uh, including white Jews, uh, are, are working through is very difficult to take that up in a meaningful way in a one hour um, session. And, and so, you know, it, to Shaquille's point about taking those steps, uh, I mean, this is something, you know, I, I do in my work over the course of a semester right, or years. It's not something that's accomplished in the first class where um, Jews and non-Jews alike feel, you know, brave enough or comfortable enough or safe enough to stand up and say, well, here's what I've experienced. And, you know, this is how it made me feel, right? We need to be uh, working on this as a process rather than a particular event um, in, in, in a given day. Kathy, let me get you to follow up on that. And I'll, I'll pick on Josh's uh, expression, whiteness is privileging, not pick 
take on, but I'll, I'll just focus on for a second, the notion that whiteness is privileging. I mean, you've got to know that there are some Jews who don't think that it's terribly privileging having somebody burst into your synagogue with a machine gun and, and you know, killing a whole bunch of people. There are still Holocaust survivors from World War II who live among us. So can you help us negotiate our way around all of this? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things we all, we've heard a lot of lately um, is white privilege. And we've seen a lot of backlash to this notion of white privilege, where white folks say, but I am one of the most underprivileged folks. We need to pass out separate privilege from white privilege. There are many forms of privilege. So I am not white. I do not have white privilege, but I have educational privilege. I have socioeconomic privilege. So, and you may be white without other forms of privilege. You may be white and still underprivileged educationally, uh, socioeconomically, and so on. White privilege simply means because of the color of your skin, you are allowed certain privileges. And it doesn't mean that because of the color of your skin, you are all good. You, everything's okay with you. We need to separate privileges and understand that there are many forms of privileges. White privilege is but one. And Crystal, I suspect the 58-year-old white oil and gas worker in northern Alberta who just lost his job because the environmentalists in Toronto uh, managed to convince some politicians not to green light some oil and gas project there don't feel terribly privileged most days of the week. Uh, they feel endangered. So is what Kathy and Josh just had to say, is that important for us to keep in mind? What I can say is... It I want to go back to like, can you teach DNI? Can you teach privilege? And again, it's not going to be in a one hour seminar seminar of, of a computer going through a webinar. It's about the experiences and creating environments in or in your organization to have authentic dialogue and to have those conversations. Cause that is truly the form of where you'll see a paradigm shift is that when one, when we can connect on that level, that's where we really have understanding and that's where biases, racism can really change and perspectives can change on that matter. All right, with less than five minutes to go here, uh, everybody here agrees that uh, this kind of diversity training is significant, that it can be, it can be effective, it can be very useful in transforming society, but I think you all agree that it could also be better. So let's spend our last moments here. Shaquille, start us off in just you know, a minute to everybody here. How could we make it better than it currently is? First of all, it's gotta start with, according to best practices, it's gotta start with non-judgment and compassion. The length of, uh, of that's needed for behavioral change, which is the gold standard, is really important. So the longer, the better. That's why I'm talking about 360 hours. Focusing on self-awareness through developing psychological literacy, that the gaps that exist, racism and sexism, aren't our fault, but our responsibility is important. And developing the social awareness around understanding how racial and gender patterns play out, patterns on anti-Semitism play out, that's all really important. And then moving towards concrete strategies, how to help people then move for the learning from here into their actions and to their behaviors. Crystal, how about to you? Yeah, absolutely. I completely resonate with those points. What I'll say uh, is it's it has to start with the self. We can't expect our organizations to teach us all of this on on you know work time. It has to be this curiosity, this responsibility that we take upon ourselves to learn about you know Canadians. Uh, newcomers to Canada, all of these experiences. So the more we take that ownership on ourselves, I think we'll be in a better place. Kathy. We need to move beyond the performative training. Diversity and inclusion training can be a checkbox for many of our organizations and institutions. And we can do great diversity and inclusion training on a very racist, inequitable structure so we must do more than training. We must push our organizations to do more because training is not the outcome. It cannot be 
the outcome. We cannot continue to train solely, rely solely on training without interrogating the structures on which we are built. Joshua, some advice from you, please. The teaching needs to be dynamic and adaptive, and we need to be meeting participants where they are. And that means paying attention to the types of nuances that were raised in the conversation today around privilege, for example, and otherness. And so, you know, when we're uh, teaching and, and learning about the complexities of our lived experiences, the language we use needs to reflect those complexities. And understanding that privilege, even white privilege, is not absolute. Um, I think would go a long way in helping participants and you know people who are interested in looking to learn or even those who are required to take these uh, uh, training sessions will encourage them to think about it in the context of their own lived experiences. And once those connections between macro level structures and systems of oppression and the interlocking systems of oppression can be made on an individual level, we can begin to enact some positive change in the workplace and everywhere where we go, not just limiting it to a particular space or, or point in time. I would simply add to all that, I can't wait till COVID is in the rearview mirror so that we can do some of this stuff in person as opposed to online, because it's way better in person. At least that's my personal experience with all of this. Uh, Shaquille, Kathy, Crystal, Joshua, it's really good of all of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Many thanks and stay well. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, April 26, 2022. Despite the unity in the West over the war in Ukraine, many countries have actually not turned away from Russia, including China and India. And we'll find out why tomorrow. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. TVO.org has a brand new look online. For the latest Ontario current affairs from our digital team, from the agenda, of course, and for all of our podcasts, documentaries, and programs, check out the slick new website at TVO.org.